test. Hello. Good evening. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes? Good. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Samantha Marshall. I'm the Assistant Director of Alumni Relations here in the Alumni Office. Thank you so much for braving this weather. <laughs> I'm not sure where it came from. I feel like it's been so sunny uh, every day here in Ohio. It makes no sense to me where the rain came from. But um, thank you so much for braving the rain. And we are very excited for tonight's event. It's not every day that we get to pair such a great lecture with a tasting um, in our alumni office. So we always appreciate these really neat events. Um, I wanted to start this evening off by thanking the College of Engineering Alumni Affiliate and the College of Arts and Letters Alumni Affiliate for sponsoring this event and allowing us to make this happen. Um, a special thank you to Lori Adams and the Engineering Affiliate for helping us out to get this up and running. So uh, we're really thrilled for this evening. And I also wanted to welcome those of you at home that are tuning in. You all might wonder what's up with the cameras. I know I am because it's not my favorite thing in the world, but... <laughs> We're um, excited for this technology. We have a special partnership with Broadcast Services, who is helping us impact our alumni all over the country and all over the world. With Broadcast Services, we have this ability to live stream. So yes, we are t live tonight. And hopefully, I'm reaching out to our alumni all over the US, all over the world. And what's also exciting with this new technology is that we have the ability to watch this on demand. So later this evening, later this week, whenever you want to recap some of the things that you've learned tonight, check out the YouTube video. It'll be available on demand. You can watch it. You can share it with your friends, family, coworkers, um, and learn a little bit more about the craft beer industry. So now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Neil Reed, Professor of Geography and Planning at the University of Toledo. Dr. Reed is known as the Beer Professor and is an expert on the craft beer industry and its economic geography. He recently started teaching a new class at UToledo titled Geography of Beer and Brewing. I'm still trying to figure out how I get into that class. I don't know. <laughs> His research is focused on the industry's growth in the US and its potential role in helping to revitalize neighborhood economies. He has presented lectures on the beer industry to international audiences all over the world. And we are so excited to have him here in the Center for Alumni and Donor Engagement tonight. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Neil Reed. Okay, uh, everyone hear me okay? Great. Uh, so thank you, Samantha, for that introduction. As uh, Samantha said, I'm a professor of geography and planning at the University of Toledo. And since about 2014, I've been doing a lot of kind of research into the uh, craft beer industry. And one of the questions I always get asked is, why study beer? You know, what's so interesting about the kind of brewing industry? And I think there's kind of three reasons. It, oh, excuse me. This should. This is not coming up on the screen, Samantha. changing here, but not here. Oh, there. Okay, better. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so one of the questions I get asked is, you know, why study beer? Why study the brewing industry? And I think there's kind of three reasons I kind of tell people. First of all, it's an industry which, since about the mid-1980s, has been going under, undergoing some really fundamental change. And that fundamental change is the appearance and the emergence of small-scale craft breweries on the landscape. And basically, collectively, they're really kind of starting to challenge multinational breweries like Anheuser-Busch. There's over 7,000 craft breweries in the US today and in terms of market share, they have about a 13.2% market share in terms of volume. And that is not an insignificant market share. So it's an industry that's undergoing some really interesting and fundamental change. Secondly, I think the change that's taking place tells us something about kind of cultural preferences in society. Because there's a lot of data out there that shows that this kind of craft beer revolution has been driven by younger demographic cohort, what we call the millennial cohort. And I think it tells us something about 
what millennials like and what millennials prefer uh, in terms of craft beer, but also more broadly in terms of societal trends. Also, uh, I'm an economic geographer, and one thing I've noticed is the growth of craft beer is uneven. Uh, the growth is faster in some places, slower in other places, and it's also having kind of differential impacts on different places. So I think that's another kind of interesting part of this industry. The fourth reason that I don't have here is when I'm sitting in the bar, my wife calls me and says, you know, where are you? I say, well, I'm working. So <laughs> it's a really, uh, it's a really nice uh, diversion. So here's my uh, presentation outline this morning. There's an old adage that you can't understand the present unless you understand the past, right? And that is definitely true with respect to the, the, the kind of brewing industry. So before I talk about the kind of emergence of craft brewing, what I want to do is kind of look at the historical context and look at basically the American brewing industry between the 1870s and the 1970s, then move into an examination of craft brewing from the mid-1980s up until the present day. Finally, I want to talk about some of my own research, uh, and most of my research has been focused on kind of craft breweries as community and neighborhood assets, and also one specific study I've just finished looking at the impact of craft breweries on uh, property values in the city of Charlotte, North Carolina. So this overhead here kind of tells the story of the American brewing industry from 1873 up through 2018. If we go back to 1873, what we see is we had over 4,000 craft breweries in the United States basically small scale, independently owned, and focused on providing beer to kind of local and regional markets. Over time, what happened with the brewing industry, the, there were closures, there were mergers, there were acquisitions, and the industry really became a consolidated industry. So by the time we get to the 1970s, we have a small number of breweries existing, only 40 breweries, uh, large scale breweries serving basically national markets. Starting in the 1980s, we can think about this craft beer revolution starting, and then as you can see, has really kind of taken off since then, particularly since about 2010, 2011. So we now, as I say, we now have 7,000, over 7,000 craft breweries in the United States. So let's look at American brewing between the kind of 1870s and the 1970s. I'd be fair to say there's no immigrant group had more impact on brewing in this country than the Germans, right? Uh, between 1840 and 1900, 4.7 million Germans migrated to the United States. And of course, they brought with them their language, their customs, their culture, and also their beer, right? Before the Germans came, most of the beer that was produced in this country was British style ales and porters, darker beers, heavier beers, but Germans brought this lager style beer to the United States. When the Germans came, they settled in particular places, so states like Pennsylvania, New York, Missouri, Ohio, Illinois, and Wisconsin were major destinations for German immigrants. And any time the Germans settled in a city, they tended, like many other immigrant groups, to settle in a particular neighborhood. And anyone familiar with Cincinnati uh, we have the Over the Rhine neighborhood, which is an old German neighborhood in Cincinnati. And you can see that kind of outline here. Now, back in the 1890, here's a map of Cincinnati breweries. There were 23 breweries in the city of Cincinnati. 13 of those were in the Over the Rhine neighborhood. So where you found Germans, you found breweries, and you found lots of people drinking lots of beer. Uh, the citizens of Cincinnati in 1890 drank 150 liters of beer for every man, woman, and child in the city. And that was two and a half times the national average. So where you had Germans, you had a disproportionate number of breweries, and you had a disproportionate amount of beer consumption. 60% uh, of this beer was consumed locally. Go back to 1860, and in fact, 90% was consumed locally. So most of this beer was being produced was not being exported, it was being drunk by the local residents. Uh, Over the Rhine had uh, 300 saloons in 1890. This is a very small neighborhood, it's only about a half square mile. 
you had lots of breweries, lots of saloons, lots of Germans producing and consuming beer. But as I said, what happened over time is the industry became a consolidated industry. S local breweries, small breweries disappeared. Some went out of business, uh, some were taken over by larger breweries, and eventually, as we said, by the 1970s, we get to the stage where there's about only about 40 breweries in the United States. And you can see this consolidation by these numbers here. If you go to 19, sorry, 1947, uh, the top five brewer, brewing, brewing companies in the U.S. had about 19% of the market. By the time you get to 1981, the top five breweries had over 75% of the market. So an industry that was becoming more consolidated in the hands of a small number of large corporations. Uh, this basically illustrates the same point. In 1950, the largest brewer in the United States was Joseph Schlitz and Slitz had about a 6% share of the beer market in the US. Fast forward to 2005, here we have Anheuser-Busch, who have about a 50% share of the market. So this consolidation takes place. Uh, consolidation, of course, was kind of helped by the evolution of the railroad system, because the railroads and the, uh, the introduction of refrigerated rail cars uh, allowed brewers, bigger brewers, to expand their markets geographically. And here we see the uh, railroad system in 1860. Here we see the railroad system in 1890. So in a 30-year period, that really transformed the ability of these larger brewers to expand, expand their markets and basically pushing smaller brewers out of business. Now, the consolidation of the brewing industry also had another impact. What it did is it basically resulted in a situation where beer as a product became very homogeneous, right? If you're selling beer to a national market, the beer you sell, you might produce in, in, in uh, St. Louis, but the beer you produce in St. Louis and you transport it all over the country, it's gonna be the same everywhere, right? They wanna basically have a homogeneous uh, product and make it uh, identical no matter, no matter the marketplace. So what the large national breweries did is it basically started to produce light lagers and all of these that tasted very similar to each other. In other words, what it came down to was the lowest common denominator in terms of taste, what style of beer is gonna be the most palatable to the largest numbers of people. So beer became more bland, became more carbonated and consumer choice basically dwindled. If you wanted a beer, you could get this one particular style, and there wasn't too much choice in terms of other styles and other types. Most people were satisfied with that, but a small number of people kind of rebelled against that lack of choice. And they responded in two ways. First of all, they started to consume more imported beer. Uh, so beers like uh, you know, Newcastle Brown, uh, where uh, became became more popular. And the second thing they started to do was they started to open up, uh, they started to form home brewing clubs, right, to make their own beer. And then from the home brewing clubs evolved the modern day commercial craft brewery. Now going back to this idea that all beer kind of tasted the same, this wasn't just happening in the, in the United States, but it was also happening in Europe as well. Here's a fairly recent study in which researchers gave volunteers blind samples of three beers, uh, Budvar, Heineken, and Stella Artois, and basically what they found is cons consumers could not tell the difference, right? They basically all taste the same. So by the time we get to mid-1970s, we have a consolidated market, we have a small number of breweries dominate the market, we have consumers who have very limited choice. So, as I said, what this resulted in was the emergence of imported beer becoming more popular. So we have data that shows during the 1970s, import of beer increased and people were drinking more imported beer. And the second thing was that home brewing clubs started to be established in cities all across the United States, particularly on the West Coast in California. And these home brewing clubs were places where people could come together you know, share recipes, uh, taste each other's beer, 
and basically you know, talk with each other about the process of home brewing. And then what happened is some of these home brewers basically commercialized their hobby. I'm sure Ernest and uh, patron saints are examples of that type of process, right? Uh, in fact, we have data that shows that 90% of the commercial craft brewers today basically started out as home brewers. So home brewing was a way to kind of get access to beer that you enjoyed, beer that was different than the mass produced beer, and then this idea that people thought, well, we can commercialize this, right? We can, we can turn this into a business. So you see this tremendous growth of the uh, craft breweries from the late 1980s onwards. So we end up with craft breweries everywhere, right? So we've got over 7,000 in the United States, and 85% of Americans live within 10 miles of a craft brewery. This map here uh, is a 50 mile radius of where we are standing right now, right? There are 66 craft breweries within a 50 mile radius of where we are right now. So drive 50 miles and you've got access uh, to, uh, Yeah, I should have done that. <laughs> okay. So we've got, you know, breweries in our own backyard. Now, what's kind of driving this kind of craft beer growth? I mentioned the fact that, you know, it tends to be driven by younger people, and we have data to support that. And what we're talking about here is that kind of millennial demographic, that millennial cohort, cohort people aged between the ages of 23 and 38, and millennials account for 29% of the population of legal drinking age. However, millennials account for 41% of people that drink beer on a weekly basis, but they account for 57% of people that drink craft beer on a weekly basis. So this is disproportionately driven by that younger millennial cohort. Uh, what is really attractive about craft beer, particularly to the, to the millennial cohort, is the diversity that it offers. Again, the large breweries got to the situation in the 1970s where they're basically producing kind of one major style of beer, kind of American pale lager, right? Ignoring all these other styles of beer. The Brewers Association recognizes over 150 different styles of beer. And craft brewers were able to come in, and because of their business model, able to provide the consumer with all these different styles. So you walk into any craft brewery today, and what you're going to see is a dozen different styles of beer, perhaps, available to you as a consumer. So this millennial cohort who are very interested in this great diversity that craft brewing were, were offering. The second thing that was happening, I think, is there's a growing interest in the United States in products, so especially food and drink products, which have a connection to the local community, right? That are produced locally by people living locally. And these three charts here basically tell the same story. On the left-hand side, you've got craft breweries, and this is the period uh, 1994 to 2014. You see the increase in craft breweries, but you also see increase in the number of wineries, right? There's more wineries popping up across the country. Not just in California, but this gap is getting bigger. Most of these new wineries are outside of California, right? So you see local wineries becoming more popular. And then you see the increase in the number of farmers markets, right? Farmers markets have also grown considerably in the United States since the mid-1990s. So this is all part of a larger movement, what we kind of call neo-localism, this idea that people want to buy something, buy a product, that has a connection with the local community, that's produced by someone that lives here, and by companies which are very kind of philanthropic in terms of giving back uh, and being engaged with the local community. So let me talk a few minutes here about my kind of current research that I've been doing and uh, talk about one particular paper that was uh, just published in a journal called Growth and Change. And I published this with a colleague, Isabel Nielsen, who's an assistant professor of geography at the University of North Carolina in Charlotte. And Isabel, in fact, is an, is an alum of UT, 
uh, I was a member of the doctor, doctoral dissertation committee. And after Isabel arrived in Charlotte, her and I chatted, and we started to think about some research projects that we could do together. And what we were interested in is what might the impact be of a craft brewery on nearby property values? In other words, is there a, a positive externality in terms of being near a craft brewery? And we were kind of inspired by this book here by an urban sociologist by the name of uh, Ray Oldenburg. And in 1989, he wrote a book called The Great Good Place. And it's kind of subtitles, cafes, coffee shops, bookstores, bars, hair salons, and other hangouts at the heart of a community. In other words, what Oldenburg was interested in were these places where members of the community can gather and interact. And so Oldenburg defined third places as nothing more than informal gathering places and the places where people come to exchange ideas, have a good time, and build relationships. And Hickey referred to these third places as the living room of society. So you think of your, your home as your first place, your work as your second place, and those bars and, and coffee shops and bookstores where you come together with other members of the community are basically what we think of as these third places. Craft breweries, I think, the evidence that I've seen, have a particular attitude about what they bring to the community. They're not just a place where you go to enjoy a beer, right? It's a place where you go to meet people, to interact with people, whether it's friends, family members, work colleagues, or even strangers. And this is just a quote from Renegade Brewing Company in Denver, Colorado. Uh, it says, our tasting room doesn't have TVs, right? It doesn't need to. Instead of screens flashing advertisements and running the results of the latest game, you'll see the room filled with friends and family, and you'll hear the rumble of conversation accented with laughter. The tasting room is where our community comes together. It's where friendships are made, rekindled, or strengthened. So craft breweries, I think, have this attitude that they want to be community gathering places, places where people can come and enjoy each other's company. And I think craft breweries are different than bars or regular bars. I think there's a different atmosphere. I think there's a different attitude. And I think they just provide a different type of space uh, for members of the community. And you know, I probably visit uh, somewhere between 50 and 60 craft breweries a year uh, all across the United States. And you walk in there, and you just see different things happening, right? Uh, this is Canopy Bend Brew Works in Napa, California. And what you'll see here is a family here, right? A young child, a mom and a, mom and a dad, right? Kind of sitting, relaxing, the parents having a beer. Uh, you know, here's Black Cloister in Toledo, two women kind of knitting, right? And again, kind of having a beer. Uh, this is uh, Catawba Island in Port Clinton. You know, people having a beer and kind of playing a game. Uh, in some cases, the breweries actually convert their space to other uses. So this is Hopworks Urban, uh, Hopworks Urban Brewery in Portland, Oregon. And once a month, they have a, they open the space up where adults, uh, moms and dads with their kids can come. Uh, the kids get a snack, do a craft, and the parents can have a beer, right? Uh, here's Beguile Brewing Company in Chicago. It partly uses a yoga studio. So the basic idea is that these craft breweries are community assets, right? The places which try to give back to the community, the places that the community can use, not just for enjoying good beer, but for doing other enjoyable things as well. So here's the uh, study we did in Charlotte. Uh, Charlotte has a very vibrant kind of craft brewing scene. And 21 breweries have opened up in Charlotte between March 2009 and October 2016. And what we did in this particular study is we uh, looked at all properties sold between 2002 and 2017. And what we were interested in is what happens to property values after a craft brewery has opened in a neighborhood. And we were interested in particular in those properties within a half mile of the brewery. Because a half mile is kind of walking distance, right? 
to think of walking a half mile to the local brewery on a summer's evening and having a beer. And using some fairly sophisticated uh, statistical analysis, we were able to isolate the impact that the opening of a brewery had on property values in these neighborhoods. And what we found is that after the brewery opened up, single family homes enjoyed a 9.3% increase in property values. Condominiums enjoyed a 3.2% increase in their value, and we found no impact on commercial property. So again, this is just, I think, evidence supporting the fact that craft brews are very much a neighborhood amenity. There's something that people value, they bring good things to the neighborhood, and you know, people are perhaps willing to pay a premium for a, for a home or a condominium you know, within very close geographic proximity. Uh, this slide here uh, talked about a study uh, done by uh, James Fallows and Deborah Fallows. Uh, James Fallows is uh, a contributor to, to the Atlantic, so if you read the Atlantic, you may have read some of his stuff. And James is also a, uh, a pilot. He a, has a single engine aircraft. And between 2013 and 2016, uh, James and Deborah traveled the country in their single engine aircraft. They visited lots of different towns and communities. And what they were trying to figure out is what makes communities tick? In other words, what are the common characteristics of communities that seem to be successful, seem to have their act together, and seem to be moving in a positive direction? And he was looking for these kind of common themes among these successful communities. Well, you can see 10 of those right there, right? Anyone, anyone want to guess what number 11 is? Yeah, they have a craft brewery, right? And so, you know, he saw this as a sign of kind of entrepreneurship, young people getting engaged in entrepreneurship, and a very positive sign for a community. Okay, so this is uh, Throwback Thursday, right? <laughs> so I thought I'd throw this one in here. Here I am right, in San Diego, California, in 1988, drinking a can of old Milwaukee. And the reason I was drinking it is it says it's America's best tasting beer. That was a, that was a beer that got me through my uh, PhD program at Arizona State. And uh, so I guess I, even back then, I was kind of a, a, a victim of this, uh, this kind of homogenization of the, the, the product beer. So I will finish there and uh, say thank you. Sorry for the few hiccups along the way. Uh, what I would encourage everyone to do is support your local brewery. Go there, enjoy yourself, enjoy the product, talk to the owners, talk to the bartenders, because it's very easy to kind of have those conversations with, with staff members and owners that are always, in my experience, always very accessible to answer your questions. Yeah. Can everyone hear me okay? Perfect. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, I don't know about all of you, but I would like to talk to the alumni office about signing up for his research project. I have like an alumni group that travels along and helps with uh, the tasting whenever we can. Um, again, Dr. Reed, thank you for sharing your research with us. And um, the Throwback Thursday was by far the coolest thing I've seen. So thank you for sharing that as well. Um, but I would now like to introduce co-owner of Ernest Brew Works, Keith Snyder. Keith is a two-time University of Toledo alum with a BS in Mechanical Engineering and a JD from the College of Law. Where did you have the time? <laughs> Keith started brewing his own beer after falling in love with pricey IPAs while in college. After years of refining brewing techniques, absorbing every bit of information about beer he came across, and learning the ins and outs of starting a small brewery, he ventured out with business partner Scott Yarnell to bring a tap room to South Toledo, and we're so glad that you did. 2019 marks the third year of business for Ernest Brew Works, which has quadrupled brewing output since opening. Please join me in welcoming Keith. Thank you, Sam. 
Um, and thank you all for coming out tonight. I love these kind of events. They allow me to connect with people more so um, through than just product alone. Hello, hello. Okay, I'll talk a little louder. And um, thank you to uh, Dr. Reed for uh, participating in this event. And um, as an owner of one of those small breweries, I'll say guilty as charged. Um, his assessments are spot on um, with my own observations, uh, even though I'm pretty busy making the beer. So um, he did drive home a great point, which I'd like to touch on, and it is the aspect of community. Uh, my business partner and myself uh, right from the get-go, uh, we wanted to create a place that resembled some of the other small breweries that we've traveled to that we had the best times at. Um, and we each had a diversified portfolio of places all across the country that we've enjoyed. And uh, we strove to make our place something like those. And um, if you've been there, I uh, hope that it feels like those other places that give you a, a good sense of feeling and you feel proud to have been there and want to go back. Um, and as Sam mentioned, um, you know, my story starts as a, uh, as a home brewer, like a lot of other brewery owners. And um, I also had um, a bit of experience with working for a family member who tried to strike out as an entrepreneur and did not succeed. And uh, I was sort of inspired by, by him and his own story and his, his attempt. And I, I did like the idea of being, being, working for myself. That was always a big factor in, in getting involved with a business venture. Um, and uh, when I fell in love with beer and what beer can be and what beer can mean to a community, the pieces sort of just fell together. Um, Outside of that, I can speak to uh, the business for a little bit. So um, myself and my business partner, um, we, we went through a lot of personal sacrifices to get our business off the ground. Uh, we took a, um, a fairly, I'd say it's an unconventional route to getting it off the ground. We, we borrowed money from family and friends instead of going through a traditional lending institution or small business loan. Um, there was a lot of, lot of paperwork involved, a lot of late nights getting all the, the I's dotted and the T's crossed. Um, and we, we did it on a shoestring of a budget. Um, my engineering expertise, well, I, some would not call it that because I didn't, I, I didn't spend much time practicing as an engineer. But the engineering background helped immensely. Uh, different knowledge of metallurgy and processes and how to size a pump or a compressor for a given application. All that stuff came in handy for sure in reducing our startup costs. And it was actually probably 50% of my time spent on the efforts of getting the brewery open was dedicated to equipment. I'd probably say another 30% was uh, involved with actually the, the construction part of the, the build out. And so, uh, the skills were, were very crucial in my, my law degree as well. I practiced law full time for six years um, from uh, 2010 to 2016 before brewery became enough of a pull. Um, we, well, to, I'll, I'll f clarify that timeline. So yeah, I graduated law school 2010, uh, went to work full time shortly thereafter. Um, and the brewery planning started uh, about four years later. Um, and it took two years to get the brewery open. And I actually was able to go part-time at, at the legal job um, about two months before the brewery opened. That was way too much work to get the doors open um, to keep me there full-time. And I had hourly obligations that I was not making. And so it was a natural transition, although did not take a paycheck for about six months. That was, that was tough. Um, and uh, I'll never uh, forget the tolerance my wife showed during that period. <laughs> but um, 
So we, we got the doors open, and, uh, and the response was very, very welcoming from the community. Uh, I felt like uh, we were fulfilling an unmet need locally, um, sort of in the sense that uh, we had fit in with those places that we had tried to make. And more importantly, in a, in a, in a good business sense, is they, the, the people were connecting with the product, and they wanted more of it. And so we have been able to uh, grow, in fact, you know, since we've opened um, a lot more construction and engineering headaches uh, being solved uh, all along the way. But that's, that's the fun part, I guess, <laughs> um, at least for me. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm glad I was able to make it out here tonight, and I look forward to chatting with anybody, and uh, especially the Q&A. But um, I'm going to turn it back over to Sam now. Thank you, Keith. And thank you so much for sticking with those long nights and stressful moments, because we certainly enjoy having you guys in the Toledo area, so we really appreciate it. I would now like to introduce to you the co-owner of Patron Saints Brewery. Are you ready for this? Aaron <laughs> Grzanek. We were practicing the last name the, the whole time he was here. Patron Saints Brewery is a West Toledo nano brewery crafting a wide variety of beer styles. The tap room opened on July 20th, 2018. They sell pints and tasters in their small tap room, which is dog friendly. My dog will really appreciate that, although I think you'll revoke that if I do bring her to your brewery. And it's right on the Toledo bike trail. Patron Saints was founded after countless, countless nights of home brewing and wishing there was a brewery close by. Please join me in welcoming Erin. Cool, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming out. It's a great evening. Um, I know I am standing between you and beer, so I will keep this simple. Um, so thank you, UT alumni, for putting all this together. And uh, also thank you, Dr. Reed, for all of your research. Um, yeah, so our story, countless years of home brewing. Mine went the traditional sense. It started off very well, um, enjoyed what I was doing. You move from a small three-gallon size, and you keep progressing, and then you become you know, your neighbor's best friend, and everybody keeps coming over, and, you know, so you can, you constantly dream what's next, what's next, and what's next. Um, my business partner, Eric, his homebrewing experience did not go so well. Um, one batch ruined it, threw it away, vowed never to brew again. Um, so our beginning paths kind of went that way, but my mother-in-law and Eric's mom are great friends for years, and she happened to be at our house and had some of my beer, took it home. Um, we both live in the same neighborhood, so I said, hey, if he ever wants to give it another shot, just have him come up the driveway on Thursday. It's just kind of, we brew, we hang out, it's people. Um, it kind of ties back into everything you're talking about, just a sense of community. Um, so we were just brewing, and so we brewed together for about four or five years, and after countless... Um, non-sober nights, dreaming about why there's not a brewery, you know, in West Toledo or in walking distance or close to where we live, um, you know, we kind of started putting some real numbers down on paper to say, is this possible? Um, and so it's just the two of us. Um, we started much smaller than we should have, but it was the way we could get started and know that we would just kind of grow into it. Um, it has become the neighborhood hangout kind of place. We see most people from the neighborhood surrounding us. Um, I think the biggest thing that we've found in the industry is how friendly and how much of almost a brotherhood the other breweries are. Um, Scott and Keith have been in. We've visited them many a times. If you ever run into a situation, you could actually call another brewery, and they'll give you the real answer um, to help you out, which is, which is really cool. Um, and, you know, it's never a competition. Um, it's really fun being here. So um, so that's kind of it about us and how we got started. And um, so I will turn it back over to Sam. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. So we will allow um, some questions. We do have a microphone out in the cafe area. So we will um, open it up there for all of you to ask. Um, these gentlemen some questions about their journey, their research, um, brewing beer. What I've learned today is that I'm living in the wrong neighborhood. I need to get somewhere where there is a brewery and someone that's brewing beer at home. So 
Um, to all of you, thank you so much for being here. As a UT alum, um, it's an absolute, absolute pleasure to be surrounded by great faculty and fellow alumni. I love my job, and I certainly love the opportunity to be in front of all of you and to learn about um, your great accomplishments. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much to those of you at home. Yes, I need to remember there is a camera in front of me, and I know there's people at home watching. If you have any questions about this event, um, feel free to jump online to ToledoAlumni.org. We will have um, this available on demand. And I also wanted to thank all of you in the audience today that are Alumni Association members. It is because of your membership dues and your support that we are able to have great events such as this and highlight our faculty and our fellow alumni. If you're not a member, I highly encourage you to join us. I know there's some membership committee people in the audience tonight, and they're working very, very hard to bring some really great new membership benefits your way. So check those out online or in um, the cafe as well. But I certainly don't want to be that person that's keeping you from the beer either. So thank you for joining us. Thank you at home. I will now um, invite all of you to join us in our new cafe to sample some of the great beer you learned about this evening, uh, which will be paired with some uh, food provided by Chef Mike. So thank you all for being here.